Stephen, you have often said that the price the international community pays for its refusal to embrace gender equality is the, contributing to the ferocious spread of HIV AIDS. So can you give us some concrete examples of what can be done towards empowering women and guaranteeing equal rights for all? That, uh, I, I'm really, really glad that the Council had the opportunity to hear Kim's eloquence on the subject that sears the soul. Uh, as a fellow Canadian, I can say that uh, she's made a really magnificent contribution to the sense of truth and reconciliation and sanity and human decency, which should suffuse the human condition and doesn't. And, uh, and it's, it's lovely to share this time with her and with my colleagues. I smile to myself gently when Kumi smoke, spoke because I, I feel as though I'm, I'm his apprentice. I feel as though I am a continuing echo. So let me uh, agree wholly that words like empowerment worry me because they sound as though you're bestowing something on women. Capacity building is the oldest saw in the world, and the only other word which vexes me more deeply is mainstreaming. <laughs> Every single time I've seen mainstreaming applied to women's rights, it has mainstreamed women right out of the picture. I, I have yet to see in all that I have read and observed a, a situation where mainstreaming actually worked, although rhetorically it's very satisfying. Let, let, me, let me say one in a, in a continent like Sub-Saharan Africa, which I know best, 60% of the infections and 23 million people are living with the AIDS virus are women. 75% of those between 15 and 24 are young women and girls. So the disproportionate infection rates are, of course, evidence that the discrimination is intense and the vulnerability is intense and the sexual inequality is intense. And if there were ways of enforcing through law and through example sexual autonomy so that women could say no to sex or insist that the partner wears a condom, we would move significant miles forward in the struggle against the pandemic. Similarly, number two, the education of girls is overwhelming in its formidable impact. Uh, everyone here knows that, and everybody pays service and homage to it, but it really does make an astonishing difference, and girls in many developing countries are not only not quite equal to boys at primary school in numbers, but in secondary school the disparity is huge, and in university it's monumental. And yet we know that the education of a girl means a much lower infant mortality rate, a much lower maternal mortality rate, a much better sense of immunization, a much better sense of how to bring up children, a much better sense generally of being a full and, and human being able to look after family and associates and friends and community. And we're still struggling. Uh, it's true. It's crazy so many years later, but we're still struggling with this business of, of educational equality for girls when we know what a profound difference it will make. Michelle Bachelet, the Undersecretary General for UN Women, in her speech celebrating International Women's Day, emphasized three areas, political representation, economic empowerment, and sexual violence. Uncharacteristically, she became quite emotional. She talked about acid being thrown in the faces of women. She talked about child brides. There was, there was pain in her voice. Uh, she, she understood, I think, even more vividly than when she was president of Chile what is happening to women around the world, and it, it causes her anguish. What causes more anguish is having set up UN Women in a, in a consensus vote of the General Assembly of the United Nations. It's now being starved by the donor countries who s promised so much and are delivering so little. And that's a lesson which should be noted, that you, you finally, after so many years, establish a new international agency for women, and then you don't give it the money it requires to function as all of us would wish it to function. And we know if there was power on the ground with voice and resources to support the women's activism, it would make a difference uh, night and day to what women achieve. 
in political representation, you've heard under 20% of the parliaments are represented by, uh, by women in terms of the membership. And of the 186 heads of state in the world, 16 are women. And if you want to know why the world is in a mess, that's a pretty clear uh, indication of how it happens. In terms of economic empowerment, 66 of the world's work is done by women. 50% of the world's food is produced by women. 10% of the overall income is received by women, and 1% of property is owned by women. So the imbalances are so profound and so marked that if we were able to overcome them and we made them parts of public policy, obviously it would make a difference in the lives women lead and handle, therefore, the controversies of disease, which so imperils them. They're so strong. I, 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 I hope that is, is understood. The women who are living with HIV at community level, they're, they're looking after their families, their community health workers reaching out to the villages. They are sustaining the entire society. It's, it's phenomenal the strength they show and what little paucity of support they receive. And then there's something called, if I may, just before I end, echo the words of the president, there's something called sexual violence which transmits the AIDS virus in significant measure. And something important has happened in the international community in the last few weeks, and I want quickly to make reference to it. In December of 2010, the Security Council of the United Nations passed Resolution 1960, which said to the Secretary General of the United Nations, we want you to prepare a report on sexual violence in conflict, and we want you to name names for the first time ever, we want to shame and name the countries and the groups in the countries that are fostering the sexual violence because we understand not only the imperiling of women's lives but of the consequences to the community generally. And so the report emerged in January of this year, the first report. And on February 23rd, just past, the Security Council had an open meeting to discuss the Secretary General's report. And what was astonishing about the report, stunning about the report, was not only that it named country after country and groups within the country who were promoting and fostering and driving sexual violence of the most hideous kind, but in the middle of the report, there was a whole section on electorally orchestrated sexual violence. So it wasn't merely violence in conflict settings. It was a recognition on the part of the drafters of the Secretary General's report and in his words that sexual violence politically orchestrated is of a similar level. And I, I, I breathed a sigh of relief when I saw that because there's one country whose name is rarely mentioned in the Human Rights Council which has engaged in the most intolerable use of rape of women of the opposition party in the pursuit of electoral goals. And that's the country of Zimbabwe. And I'll have more to say about that at a meeting slightly later this evening when I will uh, deliver an actual statement and circulate it and have a report which may be of interest to people in the Human Rights Council. But it is fascinating that we're finally going to be able to deal with sexual violence in any circumstance which so seriously transmits the AIDS virus, compromises the lives of women. And I note with the President of the General Assembly that it is an issue on which the progress has been so incremental as to be heartbreaking. It is unconscionable, indefensible, and this Human Rights Council has an opportunity to do and say on sexual violence what hasn't been done in the rest of the international community. Thank you.